Hello and welcome to Mysteries of Science. My name's Dan and I'm the editor of Science and Nature, the monthly magazine from the team behind the week junior. And I'm Michael, the acting deputy editor. On this podcast, we explore the strange phenomena and bizarre events that have left scientists scratching their heads and, despite their best efforts, remain well and truly unsolved. Now, Michael, I know that you're very excited for uh, World UFO Day, which is just around the corner. My favourite day of the year. Of course, yeah. And where, when is it again, remind me? On July 2nd. I've been counting down the days on my calendar. Absolutely. So how about in this episode we look to the skies and see if we can solve the mystery of these uh, unidentified flying objects? Yes, UFOs or UAPs, as I believe they're now known, which stands for Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena. Now, these have fascinated people for years with sightings recorded across the globe. So what are these mysterious objects in the sky? And... Where have they come from? I mean, could could they actually be visitors from another planet? I, I really hope so. But um, I think we're going to have to get some expert guests along to help us investigate this one. Dan, what's up that? What's that? Up there? Whoa, whoa, where, what? There, look, up in the sky. Ah, I don't know. So let's go and find out. This is Mysteries of Science. <laughs> Michael's absolutely cracking up. Right, Michael, pull it, pull yourself together. <laughs> UFOs, okay. Um, we said right at the top of the show that uh, that UFO stands for unidentified flying object, but there was another term that you used that that confused me. UAPs. So um, before we go any further, we need to be a hundred percent sure of of exactly what we're talking about here. Well, Dan, thankfully, I know just the person to help us out. Hi, so my name's Catherine Hewlett, and I write about science for kids. I'm the author of a couple different books for kids. One of them is Strange But True, and that's about the science and history behind 10 of the world's greatest mysteries, including aliens and UFOs, cursed mummies, ghosts, sea monsters, psychics, and more. Uh, My latest book, though, is Welcome to the Future, and that's about how technology could transform the world in the future. So that book includes things like whether we'll ever have fusion energy, robot friends, pet dinosaurs, and more. And I also write regularly for Muse Magazine, Front Vision Magazine, and Science News Explorers. Well, hi, Catherine, and welcome back. Um, some Some of you loyal listeners may remember Catherine from the very first season of Mysteries of Science, as I recall. Um, So tell us, what exactly does UFO stand for? The term UFO stands for Unidentified Flying Object. Uh, So originally it was a term meant to just mean we don't know what something is in the sky. But of course, over time, a mythology has built up around it. And now when people hear the term UFO, the mind immediately goes to aliens from outer space. So... (laughs) Because of this, uh, NASA recently renamed these objects UAPs, which stands for Unidentified Anomalous Phenomenon. Um, And they did that because they wanted to kind of separate the idea of something that we don't know what it is in the sky from aliens from outer space. Because when there's something that you don't know in the sky, that doesn't mean that it's an alien. It just means you don't know what it is. So if UFOs don't necessarily mean that they're aliens, then how come the two seem to be so closely connected with each other? And What about flying saucer? That's another term I've heard. Where does that come from? So yeah, the story of UFOs really began with a pilot named Kenneth Arnold. So in 1947, he was flying near Mount Rainier in Washington state, and he saw these objects kind of flying in formation along the mountain. And he described them as looking like saucers skipping across water. And so that's where the name flying saucer came from. All right. So that's where the term flying saucer came from. I, I mean, do we know what he was seeing? Was it, was it actually aliens? Now, scientists think that was probably uh, like an optical illusion, like kind of like when you're driving in a car and it looks like there's like water on the road, but there isn't. There's a similar kind of thing that can happen um, along ridgelines and mountains that now people think is what caused what he saw. Um, but at the time, you know, news of the sighting kind of spread all across the US. People were very excited about this. Um, And someone near Roswell, New Mexico, named Mac Brazel, he found all this weird wreckage near his farm and thought it was a crashed UFO, a crashed saucer. So he brought it to, you know, uh, to government officials and they said, no, it's just a weather balloon. Um, But this these two things happening at roughly, you know, around the same time kind of fed this this myth of that there are these alien saucers out there. There are these UFOs and they are from other planets. Because, you know, there was this actual wreckage 
uh, and this pilot, who was a pretty credible source, both saying they'd seen something at around the same time. Speaking of credible sources, Dan, you're the editor of the Wheat Junior Science and Nature magazine, a very credible source of information. So tell us, have you ever spotted a UFO? Um, <clears throat> well, no. Never. Or at least not that I could, uh, could publicly say. Me, me neither. No. So, um, well, not for lack of trying, eh, Michael? No. How about you, Catherine? Have you ever seen a UFO? Uh, no, I wish I had. I mean, I do see things in the sky, but most of the time I, I kind of know what it is. You know, I'll see stars or planets or I've seen meteor showers, which are super cool to watch. But I can understand how someone who maybe doesn't know as much about the sky might see something like that and think, you know, could that be a spaceship? So I, I definitely understand how if, you know, my mom was really into science uh, and she used to take me out back with a telescope and show me what things were in the sky. So if someone hasn't had that experience, I can certainly see how they might see something that's a normal part of the sky and think, you know, this might be something more than just a star or just a planet. Okay, right. It's a little bit of a worrying situation we find ourselves in here. It seems like uh, at this early stage, our investigation might have hit a little bit of a dead end. We've got uh, three firm <laughs> UFO nose, UF nose here. Um, so, well, we know what we're talking about when we're discussing UFOs, but I don't think we're any closer to finding out what they actually are. How about we speak to somebody whose job it was to investigate UFOs for the British government? Hi, I'm Nick Pope, and I investigated UFOs for the Ministry of Defence. Wow, what a cool job. Welcome to the show, Nick. Um, tell us, how does one end up with the job of UFO investigator? I mean, just in case I ever want to uh, change careers uh, from magazines? I got the job quite by accident. I was a career civil servant and the posting policy was that they move you around to a different job every few years. In 1991, the vacancy on the UFO desk became available and I was due for a move. So it just happened almost by accident. I had no previous interest in the subject and no particular beliefs either way. And so what did your job involve then from day to day? I mean, what's a day in the life of a UFO detective? We were headquarters based, so most of it was done from the office. We got about two or three hundred reports each year. And my job was basically to try and find conventional explanations for those sightings by cross-checking with with flight paths, military exercises, weather balloon launches. We would talk to astronomers, to meteorologists. We would check the radar tapes to see if anything unusual was being tracked. And if we had photos and videos, we had our, our own experts who, who look at that sort of thing. And at the end of the day, we were able to explain most of these things as misidentifications of ordinary objects and phenomena. But around 5% we didn't explain, so um, that's still a mystery. We obviously didn't say that that meant they're aliens, but we didn't rule it out either. I mean, unknown means unknown, nothing more, nothing less. Okay, so... 95% of these things that were, were seen in the sky were actually mis misidentifications of ordinary objects and phenomena. So what kinds of things uh, are we talking about here? With the nighttime sightings, uh, most of the, the misidentifications were of, of bright stars or planets, and particularly Venus can, if you, particularly if you're not used to seeing it, um, if, if you're, for example, from a uh, city and then go, go to the country and see it in its full glory, it can be pretty spectacular. So that's something. But also satellites, uh, meteors, um, including fireball meteors, and um, more recently, Chinese lanterns, of course, uh, lots of sightings attributable to that. And, and then some slightly more unusual things, but conventional nonetheless, like uh, when a rocket is launched and then re-enters the Earth's atmosphere and 
burns up uh, high, high above the ground. That can be quite spectacular. Okay, that's interesting, but come on, Dan, never mind the 95%. I want to know about the 5%, those cases they didn't have an answer for. Nick, can you tell us about one of your most mysterious, unexplained UFO sightings? We had a very interesting case. I, I remember it was 1993. March 30th and 31st. So over a period of about six hours, we had several dozen reports coming in from different parts of the UK. Uh, Some sightings clustered around one in the morning did seem to be caused by the re-entry of a, a Russian rocket into the atmosphere. But we had other sightings from from earlier and later involving a huge triangular shaped Craft, and, and this is something that's been reported all around the world. There are some very interesting cases from the United States, uh, some interesting cases from Belgium, uh, and we had those. And I remember talking to some of the, the military witnesses, and they said it was really spooky. This thing was moving very slowly, maybe 30, 40 miles an hour, and then suddenly accelerated away to the horizon um, a Royal Air Force witness said he'd, he'd never seen anything like it in his eight years in, in the, uh, the military. And when I interviewed him a few hours later, his voice was still shaking with emotion as he was recalling this. How strange. Whoa! <laughs> That's giving me the chills. Yeah, big time heebie-jeebies. Nick, why don't you put all of our minds at ease and tell our listeners what they should do if they think they've seen a UFO? Well, if you do see one, if you are lucky enough, first of all, do try and get some good photos and videos of it. And then, you know, maybe send it to the local media or or to a UFO uh, research and investigation group. But I think the first thing to ask yourself is just the common sense question. Well, what, what does it look like it might be? So, for example, if it's at night and you see flashing lights and and particularly green and red, say to yourself, well, wait a minute, aren't those the color uh, lights that aircraft are, are usually displaying? And then find out what what the area is. Is it is there a military base there or is it on a fly path, flight path, something like that? And um, were there any particular stars or planets that were bright that night? Was there a meteor shower? There are lots of resources on the internet that, that you can go to. Uh, you, you, can, you can look up uh, various astronomy websites, for example, and, and check for things like the Starlink satellites, which cause a lot of UFO sightings these days. So the, there are a lot of resources out there and run through that checklist and, and tick them off one by one and and then maybe you'll find the answer and if it's a conventional explanation you can say well i've i've done a good piece of detective work and if you can't explain it well who knows it's it's a genuine mystery right nick thank you that's a really good checklist to follow um let's just recap that check to see if there are any airplanes flying overhead if you're on a flight path or a military base is nearby was it a meteor shower you can look up that kind of thing on the internet or perhaps even a satellite if any of you have ever spotted something strange in the sky or um you've got your own explanation perhaps of of what ufos could be uh why don't why don't you let us know we'd love to hear from you yes you can send us a voice message by heading to funkidslive.com forward slash mysteries and hitting the big red button we can't wait to hear from you I don't want you to worry if, like me, you find this sometimes a little bit spooky. Um, in fact, according to Catherine, our fascination with things like these kinds of cases can actually help keep us safe. Honestly, I think the main cause for UFO sightings is the human brain. Because what I love to tell kids is that the brain did not evolve to tell us what's actually out there in the world. It evolved to keep us safe. So that's why we, you know, hear monsters in the dark in our bedrooms. It's why a strange light in the sky might seem like an alien. Basically your brain, any like little sensation you get that you can't explain to keep you safe, your brain jumps to what if this is something dangerous or what if this is something, you know, out there that I need to look out for. So your brain's first, first like reaction to a weird breeze or a weird light is not, that's just 
you know, that's just the breeze or that's just the sun reflecting off something. It's like, that's a bad thing that I need to get away from. <laughs> so this is a very natural tendency that we all evolved to keep, to keep us safe. And I think that's really why people see, you know, UFOs is because their brain is trying to keep them safe. Ah, how interesting. So we were looking to the skies for the answer, Dan, but perhaps the, the key to this mystery was inside us all yeah. along. As it quite often is with uh, these kinds of things, the key is inside us. Um, so I think there's only one thing left to do, right? I think it's time we, we cracked out the mysteryometer. Um, now, for those of you who may be new to the show, um, the mysteryometer is a, a very advanced piece of technology um, that we use to tell how close we are to solving a mystery. It has a scale that runs from zero to a hundred, and zero is kind of we know nothing about the mystery, and it's still a complete and utter mystery to us um, and a hundred is that uh, it's solved we've investigated and we know what it is and the case is closed so I think we should go to Nick as our resident UFO investigator to tell us please Nick where are we on uh, the mystery ometer I put a high figure on it because of the fact that so many of these do have conventional explanations but the more we we look at at the universe, whether it's with optical telescopes or infrared telescopes, and, and the more we look through some of the sophisticated technologies that we have, like uh, satellites, um, the more we find that we don't know. So I don't know. I'm going to go high, but not too high. I'll say 70%. 70%. Okay, not bad. As Nick says, most UFO sightings have very normal explanations, but there's still those unexplained cases out there keeping the mystery alive. Very much so. Yes, now don't forget to join us again in two weeks time, where we'll be splashing down from the skies into the sea. Mike will be stripping off into his speedos to go swimming with sharks. Yes, we're, we're throwing him in with these uh, fierce, dangerous, and possibly misunderstood predators. Are you ready for that, Michael? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay then, until then, stay, stay curious. curious.